awesome God you are worthy to be praised and that's why we've come to praise your name we praise you for your goodness your faithfulness for the generous and loving way you watch over us take such good care of us give to us and forgive us God you are an awesome God and worthy to be praised we thank you and praise you for your mercy your grace we thank you and praise you for being an awesome God as a matter of fact we thank you that you are still in the blessing business and so for that we bless your name and our God we thank you and praise you for this moment that you have arranged for us to meet you in this sacred space we're not here by accident we're here because you have planned it as a matter of fact we thank you that in your omniscient omnicompetence you know what we are up against what we are going through what we are dealing with and where we need to grow God we need a word from you we need to hear from you if we don't hear from you what shall we do so please God remove any distractions that may divert our attention don't let me or anything in me or about me get in the way of what you are up to and what you want to say and accomplish through me as a matter of fact hide me behind the cross and help us to see Jesus and we'll give you all of the glory and all of the honor and now God stand in my body take over my mind and my mouth bless and give power to your word Yes, Lord, give power to your word and show us your glory. Give power to your word and have your own way. Give power to your word and do exceeding abundantly above anything I can ask or imagine according to the power at work within me. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. and hallelujah. What a mighty God we serve. Our God is good. Our God is awesome. Our God is worthy of worship and praise. Y'all not feeling me yet. Let me see if I can help you. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lambs. Serve the Lord with gladness. Y'all still not getting this. I'll see if I can help you. Matter of fact, let me help you. Do, get, do, do the breath test. Just The Bible says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. You got breath in your body. It's because God gave it to you, and God is good, and God is worthy to be praised. Amen. God bless you. I am indeed excited and delighted, Peacock Proud and Honeymoon Happy, uh, to be back here at uh, Greater Centennial. I praise God for uh, the phenomenal ministry of this church that uh, is led by such a gifted and godly gospel pastor and preacher, uh, and Pastor Pogue, I thank God for his ministry. I thank God for what God is up to in the life of this church and in your life uh, because of the sagacious, spirit-led shepherd uh, that leads Greater Centennial. So I am indeed honored and happy to be here. I salute him in his presence and we lift him up to God in prayer knowing that our omnipresent God is good and is with him just as God is with us. And so I thank God for uh, Dr. Pogue. I thank God uh, for my sister of long standing, uh, Reverend Agar, thank you so much for your generous and gracious words of introduction. I'll pay you afterwards for uh, all of that. Uh, I was praying that God would forgive her uh, while she was up here lying on me and then I pray that God would forgive me because I like the way she lied on me. So uh, I want to thank her for uh, her graciousness. Thank you so much to the music ministry uh, for creating the climate uh, for us to experience uh, God's presence and God's power. Now I'm under assignment. I understand that uh, our theme for uh, this season has to do with generosity. And so I want to call your attention to a passage of scripture found in the gospel according to Luke and there in Luke's gospel the 12th chapter beginning at the 29th verse we find the words of our text for this message Luke chapter 12 beginning at verse 29 I'm going to read in your hearing from the message translation by Eugene Peterson 
but encourage you during your quiet moments to read of the whole 12th chapter for it constitutes the context out of which we shall attempt to teach and preach but I want to focus our sermonic spotlight uh, beginning at verse 29 of the 12th chapter of Luke's gospel it reads what I'm trying to do here is get you to relax not be so preoccupied with getting so you can respond to God's giving people who don't know God and the way God works fuss over these things but you know both God and how God works. So steep yourself in God reality, God initiative, God provisions. You'll find all you ev your everyday human concerns will be met. Don't be afraid of missing out. You're my dearest friends. The Father wants to give you the very kingdom itself. Be generous. Give to the poor. Get yourselves a bank that can't go bankrupt. A bank robbers safe from embezzlers a bank you can bank on it's obvious isn't it the place where your treasure is is the place you will most want to be and end up being I want to put tag on this text and for a few moments with your prayers I'd like to use as a subject from which to preach cranes in the sky cranes in the sky a crust of bread and a corner to sleep in, a minute to smile, but an hour to weep in, a pint of joy to a peck of trouble, and never a laugh, but the moans come double, and that is life. Those words come from the pen, pain, and predicament of that leading poet of the Harlem Renaissance, Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Paul Lawrence Dunbar had been diagnosed with tuberculosis, to make matters worse, his lady love, his boo, had walked out on him at the time he needed her most. And now doors of opportunity for his poetic genius were being slammed shut in his face. And so Dunbar, looking at life as being unfair, life as being fraught and filled with contradictions, declared a crust of bread but a corner to sleep in, a minute to smile but an hour to weep in, and on and on he goes. Dunbar, in a real sense, found himself stressed and unfair under the gun of pressure because of the predicament he found himself in and there appeared to be no way out of what he found himself in I didn't come through let me press it further a few years ago as a matter of fact fact it was during the 70s there was a peace conference that was held in the Middle East and this peace conference being held in the Middle East was being conferenced in a hotel, a five-star hotel there in the Middle East. Check out what happened. Some Bedouins came to the conference. You already know them as desert dwellers. And when they came to the conference, they came to the conference drained, disappointed, and discouraged. Why? Because the January rains had not come. And as desert dwellers, they were dependent upon the January rains. The rains did not come. Their water resource was drying up. And now they are attending this Middle East peace conference they show up at the conference with the weight of worry on their shoulders and you understand why because they have to handle business at the conference even though their hearts are concerned about what they are running out of can you relate to them have you been there yourself have you had to go to meetings determined to fake it until you make it why because you knew what was in your situation that's why it's dangerous to judge someone else because you never know what someone is going through, what they're dealing with, and what they are up against. Preach, Freddie Haynes, I'm about to do it. As a matter of fact, I've discovered if the grass looks greener on the other side, I promise you they have a higher water bill. And with that being the case, my sisters and brothers, here are these Bedouins, these, these desert dwellers who are weighted down with worry, and you understand 
understand why their water resource is drying up. There is nothing they can anticipate that is going to correct their jacked up situation. And yet they have to attend this Middle East Peace Conference and step up their game and handle business. Well, my sisters and brothers, they check into the hotel and immediately they are blown away and you understand why. I told you they were drained, despondent, and discouraged because the weight of worry about their predicament of what they were running out of with no hope of any kind of rescue coming their way. And yet when they checked into their respective rooms, you already know where I'm going, their eyes were wide-eyed as they were blown away and you understand why by running water that came from what the sink and then they turned on the faucet in the tub and water came into the tub they turned on the water in the shower they were not used to this they are desert dwellers they had never seen running water their minds are blown their hearts are happy and they enjoy the conference they handle business but now the conference comes to an end check out what they decided to do they made up their minds that they were not going to leave this water resource here at the conference they were going to take it back to the desert and so one of them said that he would volunteer to unscrew the faucet and the knobs and then put them in a bag and take them back to the desert that's exactly what he did when they arrived back home in the desert all of their fellow Bedouin desert dwellers came to gather around them to hear the Middle East Peace Conference report only to have them say our worries are over. Why? Because what we have is going to solve our problems. And they said, what are you talking about? The conference was that good? No, it was better than that. We have a water resource that is portable. They then took out of their bags the shiny faucets and knobs and placed them on the desert sand and then they turned the knob. You already know what happened. Nothing happened whatsoever. The knobs, the faucets were gleaning in the desert sun and yet they produced nothing. Why? Because they were disconnected. I'm about to get you. Because my sisters and brothers, what the Bedouins didn't understand, what they wanted was not going to work unless there was a connection. And I came to Greater Centennial to simply talk tonight to somebody who wants to keep it 100 enough to testify that every now and then in your walk of faith you have those miserable and melancholic moments where no matter what you turn nothing is working why because even in our faith walk we reach those moments where we feel a sense of disconnection disconnected is there anybody here honest enough to say I've had those moments in my life where I felt disconnected. Sometimes, can I keep it real? You will feel disconnected from God. Is that not what Samson, the player, felt when the Bible lets us know the player got played? He got played by Delilah, got his hair cut off, and the book says that he decided to shake himself free from the Philistines who had grabbed him. But the text says, but he did not know that the Lord had left him. In a real sense, Samson was disconnected from God. Y'all still not feeling me because you say that doesn't apply to you. If it doesn't apply to you, then you better than Jesus because the Bible says that hanging out on Calvary, Jesus, the Son of God, looks up to God and declares, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And if I keep it 100 every now and then, it seems like God is not answering my prayer it seems as if God evidently has caller ID and the moment my prayer shows up on God's line it's almost as if God decides not to hear me no wonder the Shakespearean character said my prayers go up but my thoughts remain below and words without thoughts never to heaven go he's speaking of a disconnection somebody came to church tonight and if you're real with yourself every now and then you feel a disconnection
disconnection from God not just God you can be disconnected from yourself do you not know that there are times when you just can't get it together that's when you are personally disconnected disconnected from yourself I'm a football fan so I'm watching in recent days a football life where they show the story of Charles Haley number 94 who won five Super Bowl championships two with the 49ers of San Francisco and three with the Dallas Cowboys of Dallas and check it out during the football life check out what happened Charles Haley had that moment where he was a winner on the field but a loser in within himself so Charles Daly said that when he became a professional football player player making all of that money Dale Haley testified that he was a 22 year old with a lot of money but a hurt wounded 15 year old inside of him screaming out for help and he could not respond and I'm simply trying to say there's somebody that came to church tonight I don't know you but God has me in your Kool-Aid I'm calling out your flavor because if you're honest with yourself you feel disconnected from God maybe disconnected from yourself and you can be disconnected from other people do you not know that you can be around people and yet feel lonely do you know that you can be around people but they don't get you and you don't get them in a real sense my sisters and brothers these desert dwellers did not have a resource in the midst of the desert why because of the fact that there was a disconnection I like the metaphor I'm pushing disconnected in a desert I'm gonna hang out right there because that's where somebody is even tonight disconnected and you find yourself in a desert like situation I'm gonna go ahead and be real because y'all not trying to feel me yet this happened to me last year it tripped me out because I was preaching for a homie of mine in California and I had preached for him the year before and the year before we had gone to his dad's house after church and his dad had thrown down I mean his dad can cook so good if my mother had been around she'd have been slapped because that's how good the food was I mean he put his foot off in that food that food was some kind of good and so I told him man your kind of talent should not be wasted they should be monetized you need to have a catering service at least a restaurant at best he said that's in my vision I'm going to have it next time you're here and y'all last year it was going down like four flat tires because there I am in Cali 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 and once I saw him that night at church he said tonight's the night you're coming to the restaurant I have to leave early to make sure all is well for you I said cool in the gang church finishes I pronounce the benediction we stand down front the pastor which was his son and I and we exchange greetings in the midst of exchanging greetings the pastor my boy got word don't miss this that one of his members was playing hide and go seek with death in I see you he turned to me and said Fred as much as I'd like to take you to dad's restaurant I'm going to have to go to the hospital but don't worry I'm going to make sure you have adequate ground transportation I said that's what's up I'm praying while I'm eating so go ahead and handle your pastoral business and so that's exactly what happened I then got in the ground transportation I was taken to the restaurant but check out what happened we pull up to the restaurant at 9 59 my driver parks I tell him you go ahead and come after me I'm running to the restaurant like a sprinter no like Usain Bolt running the 100 meter dash y'all should have seen me as I ran from the parking area to the restaurant I showed up at the restaurant it's 9 59 a sister then comes up to the door and she sees me I know she saw me Ray Charles would have seen me and you know what she did she turned the knock and then to magnify the misery I'm feeling she then flipped the sign the sign said open and then she flipped it and it now said close I'm standing there and it gets worse check out what happened rain begins to come down I am locked outside of the structure because the sign said 
close to me. I'm not even done because it gets worse when I look inside through the window of the structure. There were people inside who were enjoying a meal that I was supposed to be enjoying. And what was jacked up, they didn't even look my way. They kept enjoying the meal, not in, 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 in no way understanding that the sign that said open to them said close to me. The structure in a real sense had locked me outside the privileges they were enjoying and to make matters worse it's raining outside while I'm missing out on the privileges they are enjoying. Y'all not getting this. I gotta give it to you a little bit more because if I'm real real with you I had been through a dark season or was going through a dark season where it seemed like God was not hearing me and this for me was a metaphor for my life a door had been shut I'm locked outside in the rain and others are enjoying privileges don't act like I'm by myself because that my sisters and brothers speaks profoundly to what's happening in these yet to be United States of America because we are in a sick time in this country it's a sick time because of Trumpism I didn't say Trump I talked about Trumpism because Trumpism is what produced Donald J Trump number 45 y'all not getting it our nation is sick our nation is in trouble why because we have a liar who will lie and tell a lie that he did not lie and not apologize for his lie in the White House who is president we have an attorney general who was deemed to racist to become a judge and yet now he presides over all of the legal affairs of this nation we have a white supremacist and nationalist who is running the White House we have my sisters and brothers a Congress that has only one obsession and that is to overturn the legacy of the last president Barack Hussein Obama we are in the rain standing outside of privilege and those in Inside are not concerned about what's going on with us because they are so determined they have passed Trump care Ryan care I call it trying care and trying care is reverse Robin Hood because Robin Hood robbed from the rich to give to the poor and Ryan care and Trump care robs from the needy to give tax cuts to the greedy I'm preaching y'all just not getting this thing and so our nation is in a sick time and many of us are stressed and distressed we are under pressure standing outside the structure of privilege because of what's going on on the inside and that's a jacked up situation to be in and so you have the Bedouin desert dwellers who in a real sense are in a drought in a desert disconnected I'm standing outside disconnected and somebody came to church tonight and you feel disconnected if that you hang out with me homiletically and let's hop into this profound and poetic passage because Jesus the Prince of pedagogy is teaching his followers who are catching hell marginalized as minorities as a matter of fact the brilliant Dr. Aubrey Hendricks lays out for us the economic context in which Jesus is ministering they had a widening and a, an obscene wealth gap between the have gots and the have nots as a matter of fact according to Dr. Hendricks only 5% of people were really making major money and the rest were stressed trying to make ends meet they were prisoners of the predicament of not enough and that's where somebody is tonight you're in the prison of not enough you'd like to have more but you don't have more it's called the prison of not enough and that that's who Jesus is addressing but hold on your shout is on the way because the book lets us know that though they're in the midst of not enough Jesus teaches them and he talks to them about not worrying he says whatever else you do don't let worry grab you don't let anxiety attack you don't let fear freeze you because worry one writer said is advanced interest you place on troubles that may never come y'all didn't shout you may want to tweet that since you didn't shout about it worry is advanced interest you place on troubles that may never come I got to keep going because you
y'all not getting this like I need you to. Worry is just like sitting in a rocking chair. You move a lot, but you ain't going nowhere. Expending energy without making any progress. I'm simply trying to say, worry, my sisters and brothers, won't get you anywhere, but will sabotage and sink your spirit and poison your psyche. As a matter of fact, knowing I'm preaching for Dr. Pogue, I knew I had to do my homework, so etymologically, I unpacked the word for worry in the original language. It literally meant to be suspended in midair. As a matter of fact, the Anglo-Saxon word for worry means to be pulled in opposite directions at the same time. So whenever you are afflicted by anxiety, wrestling with worry, it's like being suspended in midair and pulled in different directions at the same time. And that's where somebody is. And so Jesus says, you need to get your values together and make sure that you don't place all of your value on your valuables because when you recognize that who you belong to is more important than what belongs to you then you can lead a life of generosity knowing that God will take care of you y'all miss your shout I'm gonna go ahead and give it to you real good I give it to you like this I love it I love it uh, uh what was it last year I'm watching uh, uh, Oprah Winfrey she has a special on and she's interviewing uh, the comic genius Kevin Hart Kevin Hart of course is blowing up he's all over the place thank you and Kevin Hart is doing the thing and check out what happened she's interviewing Kevin Hart and Kevin Hart gave a testimony that was so so shout worthy I had to download it on my mental computer and now I'm about to sermonically print y'all the copy check out what Kevin Hart said Kevin Hart testified that when he when, when he was growing up he was always very funny and so by the time he turned 18 instead of going to college he said mama I'm going to Hollywood because that's where my dream is going to come true and then his mother said all right son I'll do my best to help you he said are you you promise me yes I'll take care of you for at least six months but that's all I'm going to do after six months you're on your own or you better come back home and Kevin Hart testified this is gonna get you right here he goes out to LA the first month goes by it's now time for the rent to be paid he calls home and says yo mama you said you take care of my rent for six months first month rent is due where is the money I don't see anything in the mailbox mama said son I told you I'd take care of you what you need to do is make sure you stay in the word I told you before you left I take care of you and I gave you a Bible as a gift now you go ahead and read your Bible and everything's gonna be fine and Kevin said but mama I've got bills to pay I've got rent to pay and you talking about my Bible I told you stay in the word mama's good for her word but you got to stay in the word and Kevin hung up the phone in disgust after saying barely mama I love you and then the next day comes rent is due that day he called mama says mama the rent did not come what am I supposed I told you to stay in the word don't you call me again until you get in the word and Kevin hung up the phone disgusted but this time he decided to go and open up the Bible and you already know what happened there were six cashier checks in that Bible everything he needed was right there in the word and that's all we're about this month of generosity we're about about getting in the word because the moment you get in the word you discover all things work together for good to those that love God and are called according to his purposes anybody in the word yet because when you're in the word you discover no weapon formed against you shall prosper when you're in the word you discover my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in anybody in the word in the word it says be anxious for nothing but by everything with prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus
So how does this work? How does this work? How, how does this work? Because, because we've got some cranes in the sky. Now, now I've got to be real. That's not original with me. I got that from Solange. She's the baby sister of Beyonce, the queen bee. And Solange came out with, with a CD last year called, what is it? Sk cranes in the sky. And crane, it's, no, it's called a seat at the table. But a seat at the table has on it a powerful song called Crane in the sky. It's enough to shout you. Beyonce interviewed Solange to ask her about cranes in the sky. I'm about to run you out of here because Solange testified that she wrote the song eight years ago but it was not ready to be birthed yet. You see every now and then God will put something on hold until it's the right time for it to be birthed. You've got to go through a process before you can enjoy the product. Preach Freddie, I'm doing that thing. And so check out what happened. Solange testifies that, and this is really awesome right here, that she had gone to Miami after the breakdown and breakup of her relationship and she was filled with self doubt, self-pity, and a sense of emptiness. Don't judge her. You've been there. You've had those moments where you doubted yourself. She feels disconnected, you will agree. She has a sense of emptiness on the inside. You can look good on the outside, yet be empty on the inside. And on top of all of that, check this. She's wallowing in self-pity, and she goes down to Miami in order, don't miss this, to get some peace of mind and reconnect connect with herself but the very area that she had gone to for her reconnection it was characterized by construction and all she could see obstructing the view that she had enjoyed in the past were cranes in the sky and y'all I came by to say to somebody feeling Solange knows like that you feel disconnected a sense of emptiness wallowing in self pity and now you're down in self doubt that there is a God and God says you are my child and as my child I'm going to take care of you I guess that brings me to my first point right here and this is going to shout you right here and that is when you know the Lord for yourself Jesus puts it like this and here comes your shout your heavenly father has never been late with child support I'm trying not to shout, but I'm real close right now. Your heavenly father has never been late with child support. That's why some of us are here tonight, not because we've always had it good, but because even when we had it bad, God gave us just enough goodness, just enough strength, just enough peace. Anybody been blessed with just enough? You didn't have everything you wanted, but God gave you just enough because your daddy is is never late with child support payments. Ah! Hallelujah! 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 Your heavenly father is always on time with child support payments. We used to sing, he woke me up this morning. He started me on my way. The Lord is blessing me right now. Your heavenly father is never late with child support payments. That's what Jesus says in this passage. And I love it because in the prior part, in the context, he talks about how God takes care of the lilies of the field. God takes care of the birds of the air. But check this out. They're not even in the family. But God takes care of them. So if God is going to give some clothes to lilies, if God is going to feed the birds of the air, you know God's going to take care of God's own children. God is never late with child support payments. Y'all missing your shout right here. I'll see if I can bless you right quick. This, this blessed me so phenomenally uh, about two years ago. I'm doing hospital visits and in the midst of doing hospital visits, I, I came to this parking garage and, and, and in the midst of the garage, there was someone who was homeless and asking for money. I took money out of my pocket, gave it to him and, and then headed up to the hospital to visit three of my members who were there. But check out what went down. I'm visiting
visiting them, I finish the third one and I start to head toward the elevator to exit the hospital and check out what went down. This blew my mind. God is some kind of good. Uh, there was someone in the hallway of the hospital there on the seventh floor of Baylor Hospital, uh, uh, Truett Building, and, 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 and they looked at me and I didn't know them, but they recognized me. They said, Freddie Haynes. I said, hey, what's up? Not trying to get loud in no hospital, but they, they were ghetto loud and they hollered at me, Freddie Haynes. And, and, and then when he did that, check out what happened from the room where he was standing outside, a voice even louder yelled, you mean Pastor Freddie Haynes of Friendship West? Well, by now all of Baylor Hospital knows I'm doing visitation because it's that loud. And check out what went down. I said, hey, y'all all right? Trying to whisper, that's a hint. Hey, y'all all right? And she said, tell them to come on in here. And so I went to be nice. And so I went, and so as I, on my, as I was on my way in, the young man said, Said, that's my big mama in there and big mama loves you she listened to you every day on ricky smiley's show ricky smiley has a syndicated hip-hop radio show and every day he has me to do the uh do the praise break on his hip-hop show ain't that something in the midst of hip-hop he has a praise break and so so in a matter of moments you go from jay-z to freddie d don't hate celebrate one day you can participate so 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 check this out check this out Check this out. So, so she said, so he said, she listened to you every day on, on Ricky Smiley's show. So, so, so come on in because she loves you. Uh, but you need to know, doctor doesn't give her much time. She has stage four cancer and it's not looking good. And so I said, I'll pray for her. He said, okay, but she may not let you. I said, why wouldn't she? She said, just go on in. So I went on in and when I walked in that door, she sat up, Freddie Haynes, man, come on over here and let me pray for you. I don't have stage four cancer. I ain't got cancer at all. She got stage four cancer. I'm doing hospital visits as a pastor. And she said, Freddie Haynes, come on in here and let me pray for you. And so I, I said, I said ma'am, that's very sweet of you. Uh, your son just told me I'm going to pray for you. No, you're not. I'm going to pray for you. You here visiting other folk and that drains you. People don't understand how much goes out of you as you are trying to serve. And so I'm going to give back to you because you out here giving of yourself. You come on in here and let me pray for you. And do y'all know what she did? She grabbed me by the hand and she prayed one of them old school prayers where you know she and God talk all the time. And by the time she got through praying, tears were coming down the sides of my cheek as if she knew everything I was going went through and y'all when she got done I gave her a hug and she said you go on and do your thing but here get my purse right quick I said what she said get my purse right quick you can't hear either and so I got her purse and then she opened up her purse and she said here this is an offering for your church and she gave me $50 she said here this is an offering for you and gave me $20 50 for the church $20 for me here is what's gonna shout you before I get to the real shout and that is when I got back to my car I discovered I had given my last money to the homeless person and I had left my wallet at the church so I didn't even have a, a credit card to get out with but because God believes in rewarding generosity I had given to the poor and God refused to let me stay locked in the garage I'm just trying to say you can't be God's given no matter how you you try the more you give the more God but let me get back to the shout the shout is this I said how do you do this your boy told me you got stage four cancer and yet you pray for me you given to me I should be doing that for you she said oh no I'm fine you go ahead about your business I ain't going nowhere until God sends for me as a matter of fact they say I got stage four I talked to God and got a second opinion and God let me know I'm gonna be all right y'all 
going to catch that later on. And then I said, well, how do you do this? She said, what do you mean, how do I do it? Ain't you a preacher? What you be preaching about every Sunday? I said, but you have stage four cancer. I don't have stage four cancer. My doctor gave me another opinion, regardless of what this doctor said. I said, well, how do you do it? What keeps you going? Here comes your shout. She said, okay, let me break it down because I hear you like to use metaphors and illustrations. You see, I'm connected to. I said, yeah, you're connected to an IV. Exactly. In that IV, there are but there are vitamins and minerals and pain medication and all I have to do is just lay here because it's time release to come into my system at just the right time I ain't gotta move I ain't gotta call nobody I'm connected to something that releases what I need just when I need it and she said that's one IV but there's another IV you can't see and God is releasing into my spirit just what I need and is there anybody here who knows your heavenly father will release into you just what you need and just when you need it hallelujah hallelujah I got to keep this thing moving it's getting good to me the text also says not only is God never delinquent with child support but the text says the real measure of your life is not how much you do but how much you do for people who can't pay you back oh I'm preaching y'all just not getting this thing it's about what you do for people who can never pay you back anybody can brown nose with somebody that can do something for you but the real test of your faith is what do you do to that homeless person what do you do with that person who can never ever do anything for you why would you do that because you serve a God who's done just that for you you can't pay God back for waking you up you can't pay God back for the breath you breathe you can't pay God back for life health and strength so God says since you can't pay me back you turn around and bless those who can't pay you back it's about generosity how does it work because Jesus has already talked about getting your value system straight because if your values are whack then you discover it's hard to be generous because you've been so busy trying to front that you don't act your wage. And you buy stuff you don't need with money you know you ain't got trying to impress people who ain't thinking about you. You buy what you want and end up begging for what you need because you refuse to act your wage. But when you recognize that your security is not in what you have, it's not in what you wear, your security has to come on the inside because if you're not careful, you'll have a $500 weave on a 10 cent head. If you're not careful, you'll be a dressed up nobody. I love it, I love it, I love it. He says, Jesus says, give, give to the poor, give, and it shall be given unto you good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. It's more blessed to give than it is to receive. As a matter of fact, you can't really call yourself being Christ-like or godly until you learn to give. You think I made that up? Dr. Charles G. Adams puts it like this. We serve a God who are from, be from beginning until the end is going to do nothing but give. I like that because in the beginning, you know, God started this thing giving. God gave cosmos to chaos and God kept on giving. God gave blue to the sky. God gave heat to the sun. God gave shine to the moon. God gave twinkle to stars and God kept on giving. God gave height to mountains and depth 
to valleys and wet to water and red to roses and aroma to flowers and God kept on giving and then God decided to give just life and before you know it man became a living soul and then God gave Eve to Adam God gave Adam and Eve a garden and God kept on giving God kept on giving until the Bible teaches us that God gave Noah an ark God gave Abraham a promise God gave Jacob a ladder God gave Joseph a dream God gave Moses a rod God gave Joshua the victory and God kept on giving because our God is a giving God God gave David some music God gave Solomon some wisdom God gave the prophets the word and God kept on giving until God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son and y'all do know Jesus came giving Jesus gave life to the dead Jesus gave salvation to the lost he gave peace to the confused and he kept on giving as a matter of fact he gave food to the hungry he gave liberation to the captives and he kept on giving until one Friday he gave his body to a cross he gave his hand to some nails he gave his head to a crown of thorns and he died and gave his body to an empty tomb but early Sunday morning God raised him from the dead and he gave the tomb back and the book says he got on a cloud and went back to heaven but he didn't stop giving he gave us the Holy Ghost and we serve a giving God if you want to be like Jesus give if you want to be like God give life ain't about what you get it's about what you give you're not going to be remembered for what you drove but for what drove you you're not going to be remembered for what you got but for what you give All right, I'm done. I'm done. I've held y'all too long. It just got good to me. Forgive me. In the final analysis, the text says the, oh my God, this is so good. The dividends, the dividends you reap have everything to do with what you invest in. Oh. You preaching, Freddie Haynes. Thank you so much. I, I love it because the text puts it like this, that the dividends that they reap, where your treasury is, there will your heart be also. The dividends that you reap have everything to do with where your heart is. Your heart, it, your, uh, what, what, what you give to is a reflection of where your heart is. If you want to know somebody's character, check out what they give to. Check out, in a real sense, their bank statement, their bank statement, their bank statement is a heart statement that's why when we receive the latest budget from the president of the United States that budget is immoral that budget is a reflection of his heart how do I know because his heart wants to build up a military that already quadruples the other militaries of the world but at the same time he wants to cut payments to meals on wheels that serves veterans oh so you want to build up the military to send soldiers to war but you don't want to take care of those soldiers when they come home from war it tells you where his heart is oh you know what I know what's going on man y'all 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 are what's up I I love, I've, I've missed y'all. I, I, I forgot how awesome it is to preach at Greater Centennial because y'all know how to listen to a sermon. I love that about y'all. Y'all y'all are doing that thing right because, because I, I, I love churches. Watch this. Churches that know how to listen to a sermon because when you know how to listen to a sermon, you, 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 you listen and shout. You listen and listening sets the stage for shouting. And y'all really want to shout but you're listening and I love that about you you're listening because if you're listening you're thinking 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 okay is what he's saying lining up with the word thinking what is he saying that is speaking to what God is revealing to me at this season in my life thinking applying the word to your thinking ah hallelujah and and you do know sometimes that's all you need to shout think uh, uh, because the more you think, the more you thank. 
if you start thinking about some of the hell you've been through that God brought you through, if you start thinking about how God has kept you and never left you, if you start thinking about how God kept you sane in some crazy situations, if you start thinking about how God opened up doors you did not even knock on, can we have a think party right quick? When I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me, my soul shouts hallelujah. So here it is. 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 is. Y'all want to shout, but you're not shouting because you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. Freddie, what happened to you at the restaurant? Did you ever get in the restaurant? Did you get any of that good food? I'm glad y'all thought that because I got to tell you what happened. I stood there and the rain is coming down. The sign says close to me, open to them. And y'all know what I did? I remembered that the owner of the restaurant, I'm friends with his son. And so I called up his son doing the hospital visit who was the pastor, my host. I called, I called him up and I said, yo man, sorry to disturb you, but the restaurant is closed. He said, no, it's not. I said, yes, it is closed. I'm standing in front of it in the rain. He said, hold on, and he put me on hold. Every now and then, God will put you on hold. But when God puts you on hold, it's because God is working the other end of your situation. And watch out what happened. He then had me on hold. The next thing I know, the lady who had locked the door had to open up the door. I'm going to do that one more time because y'all didn't get it. The one who locked the door now had to open up the door on the one she closed the door. You see, you better be careful about messing with God's child because the very door you shut, God will make you open up that door and prepare a table before you in the presence of your haters. Here's what happened. I called the son the son called his daddy and the daddy had the door opened up for me I'm out of here but if you live a generous life and doors are shut on you here's what you do call on the son the son will call the father and the father will open doors for you is there anybody here who knows he's a way maker he's a door opener he will bless you so give and it shall be given unto you good measure pressed down shaken together and running over the lord is blessing me right now he woke me up this morning he started me on my way the lord <laughs>